Alright, so I want to start off this evening by playing a little game. How many of you like games? Oh, yeah. Alright, how many of you like I Spy? Oh, oh, yeah. Okay, now not the I Spy I used to play in the car to keep you busy when you were a kid and keep from driving your parents completely nuts if you're complaining and are we there yet questions. Uh, but I'm going to show you a picture on the screen and I'm going to give you about 15 seconds, okay? Maybe 20 seconds, I'll be generous. Uh, and I want you to try to notice as many things about this picture as you can. And then we'll come back and see how many things we can see. And by the way, uh, tonight's message is going to be a little different than normal, okay? It's not going to necessarily be a sermon where I'm just, just teaching and preaching, but it's going to be more interactive, like sort of our Wednesday Bible study might be. Uh, so I hope you're ready to interact a little bit tonight, okay? All right. So here we go. Our I Spy picture. Oh, there's our I Spy guy. All right, here we go. I Spy. Uh, hey, take a look at this picture. See as many things as you can see. Let's see how many things we can all notice. Oh, I just saw something. See a bird. Okay, don't say it out loud. Don't say it out loud. All right, just keep looking at this. All right, about five more seconds. And okay, there we go. All right, so. Uh, what are some things that you saw? Let's start out over here on this side. What are some, a few things you saw? A bowling ball with a uh, bowling pin. A uh, bowling hammer. ball, a hammer, nice. all right. A hammer, a saw, a rake. A rake? Yeah. Okay. It looked like an Elmo, but it wasn't. It was a blue face on the corner. Uh, yeah, yeah. Somebody said not Elmo, but that know, other that grumpy character. Uh, Angry Bird. I don't know. Uh, Angry Bird. <laughs> okay, how about this Elmo. side? What did you guys see? Yeah, eight balls. Oh, yeah. Caterpillar. Yeah. Emmanuel, what'd you say? It's like a big screw. Okay. Yeah. Uh, how many basketballs were there? Two. Two bad. What color were the basketballs? basketballs. There was an orange one. What was the other one? No, orange. orange one and a blue one. Very good. Uh, did y'all notice the street sign? Yeah. Uh, which way was the arrow pointing in the street sign? <coughs> What's that? Both ways. Was going up or down? Up and down. Up and down. Okay, yes, you're exactly right. It was pointing up and down. Did anybody notice, I did not see this this morning, uh, something about the hammer. First of all, what color was the hammer? Red. Red, okay. Did you notice anything else unique about the hammer? Okay, let's go back and look at this. I just saw this. There is a seahorse on the hammer. Oh, yeah. Yeah, a seahorse on the hammer. All right. There's okay. a wolf. wolf. Uh, I'm not sure about that. Isn't a, a that, is that an angry avocado? I'm not sure about that. <laughs> uh, that's kind of funky looking. Uh, so anyway, observation cool. skills are very, very important. Anybody see the zipper pull? Yep. Yeah. Okay, you saw the zipper pull. All right. And it's an eight ball. Okay. All right. Observation, very, very important. The ability to make accurate observations about the world around us is a key, key skill. It's also a key skill in understanding and applying the Bible, God's Word, to our lives. So this evening we're going to review a simple and yet proven three-step approach to Bible study. And then we're going to apply this three-step approach to a somewhat confusing and sometimes even contentious passage in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Now this is a kind of passage that I think a lot of times as preachers we just kind of want to skip over because it's like, well, how does that directly apply to a lot of people today? Uh, you know, it says some stuff in there that might even offend a few people, and we certainly don't want to uh, offend people. And, uh, you know, when you're preaching a series of messages that are only topical in orientation, you, you would probably never include this topic in your series of messages. That's one reason why I think it's important uh, to not only have topical series of messages, but also what we call expositional series, where we're simply going through a text of Scripture. Because when we do that, and when we don't skip over things, we're allowing God's Word to speak to us and say to us things that we might not be 100% comfortable with. And when it comes to listening to God versus listening to culture, which one should we choose? God. 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 Okay. Even when, when God's word says some things that sound funky in our cultural context, even more so then, right? Because that may mean that we have what's sometimes called a cultural blind spot in a certain area. So we're going to be using a guide by Howard Hendricks called Living by the Book. It's one that I have taught several times here at church. You can buy a whole book about this by Howard Hendricks. It's a video series, a whole bunch of resources. The video series is free on YouTube, so you can watch 
Uh, Howard Hendricks uh, actually teach these things at Dallas Seminary, and you can benefit from this kind of Bible study 101 sort of class. We're going to go through it very briefly tonight, and then we're going to apply it to this text. And I'm going to tell you right up front, I didn't give the people this morning the same warning, but you're going to be a little frustrated maybe in our study of 1 Corinthians 11, because I'm going to say a few things about it, but I really want you to study this one on your own and use some of the things that we talk about here uh, to, to make some conclusions uh, on your own as you look at this. So, uh, Mark, and Mark, I'm going to have you guys help me out again. I'm going to have to help your pay, huh? Okay, 10% raise for both of you. There you go. What's 10% times zero, Russ? I don't know. It's still zero. <laughs> it's still zero. <laughs> Uh-oh. Okay. All right. So this is the uh, guide to inductive Bible study. I hope you'll, uh, not only are we going to look at this tonight and refer to it as we go through our message tonight, I hope that you'll keep this in your Bible uh, and it can be helpful for you uh, as you study God's Word. There's some helpful things here that I believe will help you as we study together. God's Word. So the first step in our inductive Bible study, and by inductive what we mean is we're starting with the specifics of what God says and we're working out from there, not starting with our own presuppositions and going to the Scriptures to justify them. We're starting with the specifics of the Scriptures and seeking to allow the Scripture to inform us. So guide to inductive Bible study, step number one, say it with me. Observation. And let's, that was kind of weak. What, step number one. Say it with me now. Observation. All right. And we ask and answer the question, what do I see? What do I see in the text in front of me? So we want to look for six specific things. Things that are emphasized. Things that are emphasized. Sometimes we'll read a text and something will catch our eye and we'll just go off in a completely different direction that, that God's Word isn't even talking about because we see a word and it reminds us of something else and we go off in that direction and we get all confused. We want to read the whole uh, section of Scripture and look for things that are emphasized in that section. So tonight, if you've got your Bibles, we're looking at 1 Corinthians 11 verses 2 through 16 together. A look for things that are emphasized, the amount of space given to a topic, the stated purpose. Uh, there are a lot of times where the Holy Spirit-inspired human author of Scripture will state the purpose for which he is writing. So the Gospel of John, anybody know the purpose statement of the Gospel of John? John 20, 31, anybody know that? John 20, 31. These are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in His name. That's, that's our I want to keep key verse here at Montrose. So some of the folks know that key verse, John 20, 31. Why is, Paul, is John writing? These are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ. What are written? The signs, the miracles that He lays out for us. The whole purpose of John's Gospel is to record these stories from Jesus' life so that you may believe that He is the Christ, the Messiah, the Son of God. And when you believe, you will have life, true life, life beginning now, life forever, through Jesus Christ, our Lord. So that's exciting. The order of the material, movement from lesser to greater, look for things that are emphasized, look for things that are repeated. Uh, when God's Word repeats something, one preacher said it's not because God has a stuttering problem. All right? God's not stuttering uh, when He repeats Himself. All right? He is saying it uh, so that we will get it. The order of the material, movement from lesser to the greater, uh, look for things that are emphasized, things that are repeated, things that are related, uh, look for questions and answers, cause and effect. Movement from general statement to specific outworking. So in Matthew chapter 6, Jesus says, Don't do your works of righteousness before people to be seen by them. If you do, you've already received your reward. You won't have any reward for your Father in heaven. That's a general statement. And then he goes and talks about three specifics. Anybody remember the three specifics that Jesus lays out? He talks about prayer. He talks about, actually, it's fasting, prayer, and then giving to the poor. So general statement, specific principles. Look for that kind of thing. 
Uh, look for things that are alike. What are a few of the key words that would clue us into something being alike? Getting into your English class, your literature class here, maybe. Uh, what are some key words? As, like, even as, just as. So we see things that are alike. And then look for things that are unlike. The key word here would be the word but. So, uh, you have heard, but I say to you. Or, you were dead in your trespasses and sins, but in Christ you've been made alive. You know, these key words, but, showing contrast. And then also, when you're making these observations, look for things that ring true to life. This is really important to do. But when we look at today's text, which is kind of confusing, uh, you want to look for some things that ring true to your life. How, how can I relate to this? How can I put myself in this story? So say you're studying about uh, David, when King Saul is chasing David uh, around a mountain, and David's hiding in caves, and Saul's on the run for his life. You know, put yourself in that. What would that have been like to be him? What what is it like to walk in his shoes or in his sandals? You know, what, what might it have been like to be with Jesus and the disciples praying in the garden and seeing the, the torches come towards them and the clank of armor as the guards approach Jesus, and then in the torchlight noticing that it is Judas, your brother, who is leading them. I mean, you know, put yourself in that sort of situation. What might it have been like? Things that are true to life. So, using our skills of observation, I'm going to read this passage for you, and I want you to tell me what you observe. What's being emphasized? What's being repeated? What this is about? Also, this isn't on our list here, but I'll add to it. In observing the text, this is the time where you can pepper the text with questions. Uh, you know, what does this word mean? How is this related to this? Uh, how does this work in my life today? And you're, then you're going to answer these questions in the next step and in the third step as well. So I'm going to read it. Uh, and as I read it, know that some of your translations might use the word uh, for woman. Uh, the English Standard Version translates wife, uh, interpreting the context here. The same Greek word, gune, not the gunis, but gune <laughs> in Greek means woman or wife, depending on the context. Okay, again, 1 Corinthians 11, verse 2. Not a passage you hear preached about very often. Now I commend you, because you remember me in everything, and maintain the traditions even as I delivered them to you. Okay, well that sounds alright, nothing too controversial yet. But I want you to understand that the head of every man is Christ. Okay, I get that. The head of a wife is her husband, and the head of Christ is God. Every man who prays or prophesies with his head covered dishonors his head. But every wife who prays or prophesies with her head uncovered dishonors her head, since it is the same as if her head were shaven. For if a wife will not cover her head, then she should cut her hair short. But since it is disgraceful for a wife to cut off her hair or shave her head, let her cover her head. For a man ought not to cover his head, since he is the image and glory of God, but woman is the glory of man. For a man was not made from woman, but woman from man. Neither was man created for woman, but woman for man. That is why a wife ought to have a symbol of authority on her head, because of the angels. Nevertheless, in the Lord, woman is not independent of man, nor man of woman. For as woman was made from man, so man is now born of woman. All things are from God. Judge for yourselves. Is it proper for a wife to pray to God with her head uncovered? Does not nature itself teach you that if a man wears long hair, it, it is a disgrace for him? But if a woman has long hair, it is her glory, for her hair is given to her as a covering. If anyone is inclined to be contentious, we have no such practice, nor do the churches of God. Alright, how many of you have never read that passage of scripture before in your entire life? Alright, it's right here, right? Let me ask you a question. Is this passage of scripture less inspired than John 3, 16? No. Is it any less God's word than Psalm 23? Okay, so is it worthy of our attention? Yes. yes. Certainly. All right, now you are a little offended as we read the scripture. Okay. All right. So, 1 Corinthians 11, 2 through 16. 
As I read that out loud, what are some things that you observed as you listened or as you read? Now, I understand, you know, it's better if you have it printed out on a piece of paper. Maybe you can circle things, draw lines and arrows. I like to do that sort of thing. But what are some things that you observed as you read? What's being emphasized? What's being talked about? What are some of the key words? Jennifer. Headdress, like a head thing. Okay, head coverings, all right? So, right there, you circle that word. What does he mean here by head coverings? What, what is he talking about here? Okay? Good. So head coverings is something emphasized. What else is talked about several times? Heads Word. and hair. Heads and hair. Okay. So head coverings and hairstyles. You're like, what is this? The beauty salon? You know. Uh, okay. So he's talking about hair. And what specifically about hair? Length of hair. Right? Now, I don't have to worry at all about, <laughs> about my hair. It's just not much to really grow up. Uh... <laughs> You know, I do have a little hair on the side, so I always say I got it. I'm like, yeah, I got a haircut this morning. People are like, what hair? And I'm like, there's a little bit right here. <laughs> All right. <laughs> uh, what else do you notice about the passage? It gives a, like, crisis ahead and then the man and the woman. Okay, good. Very good. All right. So we have this teaching about headship. Okay, so we have head coverings and headship and length of hair, but the length of hair is really related to the head covering. So head coverings and headship, two key topics here uh, in this passage. Anything else? What's the context of, of what's happening here? Is this at the shopping mall? Is this at school? Is this, where is this taking place at? Where? Church. Worship, yeah, worship in the church, okay? So it's talking about when the church is gathered for worship, all right? Uh, now, how can you relate this to your own life? Well, uh, I had a young man come to me after the service this morning and say, is it okay for me to wear my hat in church? Now, here we've got one, two, three, four, five, six. Oh, there we go. <laughs> six, six or seven people that got ball caps on and various kinds of, of headwear, okay? Uh, I love to wear a ball cap. It protects my bald head from the sun. Uh, you know, all those kinds of things. Um, I don't usually wear my ball cap in church because there was just something that was kind of, you know, when you go into a school, when you go into a sanctuary, you take your ball cap off. Uh, how many of you take your ball cap off when you pray? Now, that's something I do. I always take my ball cap off when I pray. Why do I do that? Well, it's just it's something that was ingrained in me. So um, when you say the Pledge of Allegiance or when you go to a game and you do the national anthem. Gentlemen, uh, I think now they just say, please remove your hats. They used to say, gentlemen, please remove your caps. But now they tell everybody to remove their hats. So cultural expectation, sign of respect, right? So we can relate to this. So even though this seems so foreign to us, so 2,000 years ago to us, there are some aspects of this that we can say, okay, I get that. I can relate to that. There are social customs about headwear, even here in 21st century America. And there's differences of opinion about that. And maybe you can even relate to it in other ways, like when it comes to dress. You know, there's uh, certain, uh, certain older ladies, especially on Sunday mornings, that like to see their pastor in a tie. And boy, if, if I come wearing a tie and a sport coat, they get really excited. <laughs> Almost so much so excited I don't wear the sport coat that much. But, you know, and... Is there anything in Scripture that talks about sport coats? Of course there's nothing in Scripture that talks about sport coats and ties. Uh, Jesus didn't wear a sport coat or a tie. He wore a tunic sort of thing. So he wore sandals. You know, if I was walking around in sandals and see my feet, you know, people might be like, I don't know, Pastor, that's just not a very respectful look for a preacher man. Uh, <laughs> I'd say, hey, that's how Jesus dressed, you know, and then I'd get out some water and ask him to wash my feet, right? No. Uh, it's just, okay, so culture does come into play here. All right, so those are some things that we observe, okay? So very good. Give yourselves a nice round of applause. Those are pretty good observations. All right, uh, observation, what do I see? Step two, then, say it with me. Interpretation, say it again. Interpretation, what does it mean? Now, I've encountered some people recently who have a real knee-jerk reaction to the word interpretation. But let me just tell you what interpretation is a word that means, what does it mean? It's, it talks about meaning, all right? So it's not reading your own meaning into the text. It's simply seeking to understand what the text is saying. And there are some principles that we can use here as we seek to understand. 
Uh, first of all is the principle of content. That's employing the results of our observation. So all those things that you've observed, now you want to uh, use those in what you are looking at in the text. Then there's the principle of context. Context. So you start where you are. Let's say you're just reading one verse. Well, it's dangerous always just to read one verse, isn't it? In fact, you really can't understand what the Apostle Paul is saying here if you're just reading verses 2 through 16 of 1 Corinthians 11. You've got to understand it in the context of the whole book of 1 Corinthians. Just to illustrate, how many books are there in the Harry Potter series? Is it seven books? I think something like that. Um, so, seven books, and some of them are really, really big books. Let's say that you pick up book number three. What is that? Prisoner of Azkaban? You pick up book number three, and you flip it open to the middle of the book, and you stick your finger uh, on that one little paragraph there, and you read that paragraph, and then you close the book, and you put it away. Would you have any idea what that paragraph was saying, what the story was about, what that meant? Of course not. Of course not. And yet, we treat the Bible that way. Some of us will open it up. God, what do you want to say to me today? Okay, here it is. Uh, Isaiah 36, 13. Then the Rabshikah stood and called out in a loud voice in the language of Judah. Hear the words of the great king, the king of Assyria. Huh, what does that mean? Maybe I should name my firstborn daughter Rakshiba. You know, what? thank you, Lord, for this word that you gave me today. No, you know, we wouldn't approach any other book like that. And yet some of us approach it. The Bible that way, that's not right. So here in, in 1 Corinthians, uh, when we read the book as a whole, we see he's talking a lot about unity and about divisions in the church. He's talking about a negative report that he's received from people in Chloe's household. Uh, he's talking about a letter he received from the Corinthians asking him questions. In fact, all the way from chapter 7, verse 1, through the end of the book, uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 times he says, Now concerning... The matters you wrote about. Now concerning the betrothed, the food offered to idols, spiritual gifts, the collection for saints, our brother Apollo. So he was responding to things that he's been made aware of that are going on in the church. And the biggest problem is a sense of arrogance and a sense of divisiveness. Okay, so this is underlying a lot of our context here in the cultural expression of how people were wearing their hair and that use of head coverings or lack thereof within the church in Corinth. Also here, we're following on the heels of a discussion of Christian liberty, specifically liberty as it regards what we eat. And the apostle has made it very clear that when we think about Christian liberty, our practices, we need to ask ourselves, is this going to cause another brother or sister in Christ to stumble? Uh, is this going to advance the gospel or in any way get in the way of the advance of the gospel? And sometimes, as Christians, we need to realize the message of Jesus can be offensive to people today. When we say, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, no one comes to the Father except through me, that in and of itself is a message of exclusivity, which in our world today can be very offensive. But if we offend brothers and sisters, let it be the cross that offends, not us. We, our message may be offensive, but we ourselves should not be offensive. Does that make sense? So that means that if you're going into another cultural context, and sometimes when we cross cultures and travel, we're more sensitive to the culture that we're, we're traveling to. And we might be careful uh, if we're going, say, as a missionary or with a missions group to another culture, that we don't want to do something to unwittingly offend those people. So we we might study about things and think about different practices and make sure that we're not in somehow uh, offending them by breaking their cultural expectations because our concern is the gospel of Jesus Christ. Uh, so here, it would seem to me that we're dealing with, when we talk about head coverings and length of hair and all that kind of thing, certainly something that is very much a cultural sort of thing. So uh, that's point number four in our principles of 
interpretation, uh, looking at the background, that is the culture and the historical background. Now, how can you find out that? A really good resource is to have something as simple as a one-stop shop study Bible. Now, I got one here that's really big because it's large print, and some people say, that's large print? It's still pretty small. Uh, but this is my large print study Bible. Uh, having a, a good study Bible, like the ESV study Bible, there's so many out there today, the NIV study Bible, the Life Application study Bible, these are all all good Bibles, and they'll all give you just a little snapshot of some of the culture and background uh, behind things. So here, for instance, in the ESV Study Bible, again, you don't have to go to Bible college or seminary to understand this stuff. Uh, just get yourself a few good resources and consult them. That's our fifth principle of interpretation, consultation. Uh, consult a few good resources, uh, and they can help us out. So here... In the ESP Study Bible, it says the Greek phrase, kata kephales, literally means down from the head, head covering, may refer to long hair that hangs loose, to a veil that covers the face, or to a piece of cloth pulled over the head, like a modern shawl or scarf that leaves the face revealed. And so we know that there are Christians in other places around the world that dress this way. Uh, there are other religious groups that dress this way on a regular basis. Roman men sometimes practiced the custom of pulling the loose folds of their toga over their head as an act of piety in the worship of pagan gods. Paul thus draws on the example of this pagan custom as something that everyone in the Corinthian church would have thought absurd to do in the church while worshiping, to make the point that men should not dishonor Christ by praying according to pagan customs. Okay, so there's some obviously some cultural background here that we need to understand. So a man praying with his head covered would be a lot like how pagans in Corinth would pray. Uh, a woman with her head shaven, her head cut short. Well, in Corinth, a city that was full of prostitutes, uh, that was a sign of somebody who worked in the temple. Many of the prostitutes that worked in the temple of Aphrodite had their head shaved. And so in Corinth, I'm not talking about America or Chicago, in first century Corinth, <laughs> That might be a sign uh, of who these, what these women were. So, obviously that could cause some division, some distraction in worship. Paul doesn't want anything to distract us or to divide us. And so he says, look, uh, you know, pray with the head covering according to the custom. Uh, he says it's equally absurd for wives to pray or prophesy in public with their heads uncovered. We're going to talk a lot more about men and women in worship as we come to 1 Corinthians chapter 14, but let's notice here that women are praying and are prophesying, are speaking in worship. That certainly informs how we understand and apply those last verses in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, uh, which, uh, you know, again, if, if you just take that and pull it right out of the context, it seems to say that women are supposed to be silent at church. But here in 1 Corinthians 11, women are praying and prophesying. So that's very important for us to see. Uh, what else do we notice here about culture? Another good note on verses 6 and 7 about praying with head uncovered. A married woman who uncovered her head in public would have brought shame to her husband. The action may have control, connoted sexual availability or may simply have been a sign of being unmarried. In cultures where women's head coverings are not a sign of being married, wives do not need to cover their heads in worship, but they could obey and observe this command by wearing some other physical symbol of being married, such as a, a wedding ring. So a wedding ring might be a similar a symbol in our society, uh, saying, I'm married, I'm taken back off. Okay, so that's kind of what maybe a, a head covering uh, could have been. And again, as we already noted, while a shaven head or short hair was considered shameful for a woman in first century Corinth, long hair was considered to be a woman's glory. Uh, remember here, we're talking about cultural uh, expectations. So, also comparison. That's the one principle of interpretation we haven't looked at yet. Comparison of one scripture to another. The scripture is the best interpreter of itself. Head coverings, hair, very cultural oriented, okay? Uh, headship, specifically headship within the Trinity. Headship, kephale in Greek, uh, could mean source from which something comes, or could mean authority. Now, in most instances in Scripture, it clearly refers to 
an order of authority, not in the sense of inferiority, but an economic administration order of authority. So just as one person might be a manager and one person might report to that manager, both people are of equal worth, but in the economy of a corporation, there has to be some sense of authority, and God has very clearly laid this out. So within the Trinity itself, we have the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. We always say first person, second person, third person of the Trinity, because while all three members of the Trinity are equal, uh, to one another. There's no inferiority. There is a voluntary yielding of the Son to the Father and the Spirit to the Son. Does that make sense? And so Paul will say here in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 that the same thing is true in marriage as well. So a few uh, scriptural comparisons. We don't have time to look at all of them. Uh, you can write these down if you're taking notes. Genesis chapter 1 talking about creating man and woman in God's image. Men and women worthy to be treated of dignity and respect because we're created in the image of God. Genesis chapter 2 goes into more detail about the man not having a helper suitable for him. Eve, the woman, is taken from the man and is intended for the man to be a helper for him. Galatians 3.28 talks about how we are all one in Christ. 1 Corinthians 14 uh, talks about uh, women and uh, teaching and authoritative roles and whether or not they should do that. 1 Timothy chapter 2, in the same way, talks about that. Uh, Ephesians chapter 1 talks about Christ and his headship. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 23, which is really the clearest uh, picture of what this idea of headship is all about as it applies to Christ and the church and to the husband and wife within marriage. Ephesians 5.23 says, The husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its Savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, or yields to Christ, so also women should submit or yield in everything to their own husbands. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her. So, wives are to yield to their husbands as the church yields to the leadership of Christ. Husbands are to love their wives to such a degree that they are willing to lay down their lives and die for their wives. So, a husband who loves his wife like that is a husband worth, worth yielding to. Am I right? Many of us can't relate to this because we can't even relate to the idea of a husband who loves like that and who leads like that. That kind of leadership is the kind of thing that husbands are called to. Sacrificial, loving leadership that always acts in the best interests of the life and of the family. Uh, and that's what Paul is talking about in Ephesians 5 when we talk about headship. So application, our final step. Say it with me. Application, how does it work? I'm going to let you work this out on your own. I want you, uh, you know, maybe tonight you're, you're a little riled up. You're like, oh, I don't know. I don't like this at oh, all. This head coverings and headship and what in the world is this talking about? Well, I, I hope you'll look at it some more for yourself. All right? I hope you'll look at the idea of, of headship. And, and maybe you've got a study Bible, and I know there's a good one out there that says that it's talking about source, not authority. But uh, in some research I've done, in more than 50 cases of the word head being used outside of the New Testament, even always, every single time, is talking about authority. So when it says this person is the head of that person, it never means source of that person. It always means authority. Uh, a few quick notes here. Uh, based on what we talked about, we're beginning a section in 1 Corinthians where we're entitling Life Together in the Body of Christ. We've already looked at some personal observations of the text. Uh, five reasons why we should observe God's order for men and women in the local church. We've already looked at the, the divine order of God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, the divine order of creation, that man is made first, woman is made from man and for man, the presence of angels. We haven't had talked about that. I encourage you to look up that more on your own, but the scripture says that angels are present when we worship, that they are watching and observing and that we do all things in unity and propriety, uh, that informs the way we worship, right? 
I think so. Alternative understanding is that angels is the word for messengers. And Paul is saying, don't forget, there's people in your church who are messengers, and they're going to report to me and let me know how practices are going. They're basically tattletales like those from Chloe's household. I don't think that's what Paul means. I think he literally is talking about angelos, angels, uh, present with us, witnessing. Verse 10 says, because of the angels do this. The very nature of things. I think when Paul says that in verse 14, he's talking about uh, cultural expectations, your natural sense of what is appropriate for men and women. Basically, in the culture in which you live, men should dress and look like men, and women should dress and look like women. Uh, that's what Paul is saying in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 13. Judge for yourselves. Does not nature itself teach you these things? So in the culture in which you live, that should be how we govern that. Of course, in our culture, um, we dress very much uh, alike in many ways. The practice, but not intentionally trying to throw someone off. All right? The practice of the churches, verse 16 says, If anyone is inclined to be contentious, we have no such practice, nor do the churches of God. These are five reasons that the Apostle Paul lays out here to observe uh, the order of things as he is teaching us. So, summary applications here. How does all of this work? The principle of headship is neither timely nor cultural. It's illustrated by the eternal relationship of Father to Son to Holy Spirit. So also is the relationship of husband and wife in marriage. So it's neither timely nor cultural. It's timeless and it's universally to be applied. The practice of head covering and the whole discussion about length of hair, that is timely, that is cultural, that is applying specifically to the first century people in the city of Corinth, okay? And I think it would be an injustice to the text to take that out and apply that to uh, the culture in which we live. And certainly to, if we were to shame people for having short hair or to shame people for having long hair. Um, and even in Corinth, there's a big city by Corinth, a lot of movies that have been made about the city, and uh, Sparta. Okay, Sparta. The warriors, the Spartans, had long hair, and they would bind up their long hair. You don't get much more manly than a Spartan, right? So clearly, even in, in their cultural context, uh, men sometimes had long hair. Uh, the uh, high priest in the Old Testament wore a turban, a practice prescribed by God. So when practicing worship, his head was covered. So... You know, you guys that want to wear your uh, bandanas and your hats and everything, you know, uh, I, I think that's okay. And I don't think one person was uh, distracted or suffered any division because of uh, somebody wearing a hat tonight. Uh, so the practice of head covering is both timely and cultural. The principle of headship as it applies to worship and leadership in the local church must be practiced according to biblical order. And of course... Biblical order is most important, but it finds its expression as is appropriate within the given culture. So let me ask you again, what do we do when biblical order and cultural appropriateness are in conflict? What do we do when the Bible's clear teachings about something comes into conflict with what culture says? Which one do we uphold? The Bible. The, Bible, the Scripture. As the Apostle Peter said, we must obey God rather than... Than men. There's one more thing I didn't say about Bible study, and it's at the top of the handout I gave to you, but um, prayer is always where we start and where we finish in our Bible study. Begin with prayer, end with prayer, and pray throughout. Then share the Word of God with others. I hope tonight's been instructive for you. It's probably raised a lot of questions. Uh, more than half of you have never thought about this passage of Scripture before. I hope you'll take a closer look at it. If you have questions, uh, don't leave here and misquote me. Don't leave here and uh, be offended about something I didn't say or didn't intend to say. So if you have a question or something I said that doesn't settle well with you, ask me about it. Uh, because, you know, most likely... Uh, you know, th there may be some misunderstanding, or maybe there's not. Maybe we just disagree, but we can at least reaffirm our love and our disagreement, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, let's pray together. Gracious Father, I thank you so much for your word to us. Uh, tonight we've done something different. Uh, we've looked at this.
this passage of scripture uh, that has a lot to teach us, and we haven't didn't nearly scratch the surface of all that's in this passage. But God, I pray that each person who is listening to me tonight is inspired to study this passage more, to observe it, uh, to pepper it with questions, to, to do their research, to, to search out the answers, uh, and not to do so in a way where they're seeking to justify their own presuppositions, but to do so in a way where we are seeking to draw truth from your word and to be guided and taught by your word, that we might apply your word to our lives. And so God, I pray that you'll help us as we seek to apply uh, the principles of, of headship uh, to our church and to our marriages. And God, I pray that you'll also help us as we seek to apply uh, the underlying principles related to head coverings and hair as it relates to how we share Christ and how we worship within a given cultural context. God, I thank you so much for your word to us. I thank you so much. I'm excited to continue on our study next week, talk about the Lord's Supper and communion. God, it's just so good to have your word. And I pray that we will be conformed by it to the image of your Son, Jesus Christ. It's in his name that we pray. Amen. Amen. Let's stand together. Oh, <laughs> 
all raise our hands in blessing to uh, those around us. We want to say to each other, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. And all God's people said, Amen. 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 Thank you so much for coming. Uh, God bless you. I'll be around for a little bit if you have any questions, want to talk or pray. Uh, God bless you. Have a great evening. Amen. Wait just one second. I heard about William's.